and uh, welcome to everybody that uh, has joined us uh, this for this midday presentation. As you can see on the screen, this is the topic of multi-body parts. Um, from my experience, people tend to kind of raise an eyebrow. They give that um, that rocks eyebrow when they hear multi-body parts because yes, it is essentially an assembly. However, there are limitations, of course. It's not your traditional assembly. Um, and there are some tools that we can use to our advantage within the multi-body environment. Um, with that being said, as you see the subtitle, when custom fitment is the only option, what that is alluding to is a very, very unique and albeit grueling um, summer project that I was working on. Um, grilling only in the sense of my garage was had no AC and it was stuffy and it was a hotter summer than usual. So SolidWorks definitely did everything that it could to make this a much easier process for me. So we'll go into the um, into this project that I was working on, which was building an enclosure to spec for the requirements of a subwoofer. And I'll, I will also preface that by saying, I don't care for those cars where the trunks are rattling, you hear them a block away, not my thing. I was, uh, I was raised on pure audio quality and trying to recreate what the artist heard in the studio when they were producing said music. So from that aspect, I also had a very tiny cab, a single cab pickup truck, and I had to get this this speaker in there because it had been sitting around for very long. And I'll also say, yes, it was sitting around for a long time, uh, just like my headset. This is a 20-year-old headset that I was just talking to Chris about from my PlayStation 2. So I'm a very old school kind of guy. So a little bit more about me. Here is a little bit of a little bio. I do have uh, a BS in engineering physics from UMSL slash WashU. That's at Washington University in St. Louis. And that was a, a combined joint program for the uh, for the engineering degree. In that process, I did design some labs for, uh, for the advanced physics courses that the senior level um, physics students would take. And they still use one of those uh, um, one of the projects that I created even today. So that's a pretty cool thing, the fact that I had a, a lasting legacy there. I am the proud father of this two-year-old chocolate lab. I'm not going to say his name because he is currently lying behind me. Um, he is sleeping at the moment, so I will caution you guys. If you hear weird noises, it's because he is dreaming and he gets pretty audible. So we're going to hope that that does not occur. I do have my email posted up there. If anybody does want to email me with uh, questions regarding this presentation or any topic discussed within. And with that, we'll go ahead and uh, talk about the, the topics for today. And let me actually see if I can move something here. I can. Okay, so we've got that out of the way. So the first thing we're going to talk about is basically the difference between a multi-body part and assembly. I'm sure that's uh, the forefront of everybody's um, thought process right now is what, what are the differences? And we're going to be focusing on the multi-body part aspect. We're going to touch on the combined feature, which many of you maybe have only used one of the three aspects, that is add, subtract, and common. We'll talk about all three of those as I utilized all three in this project. Next one is uh, using internal volume because we talked about the specifications required for the internal volume of a subwoofer enclosure, and those are based upon each type of subwoofer that you have. Then we're going to talk about inserting that part. By the way, that part that we are displaying on the screen is a multi-body part in itself. And just, uh, just giving you guys some eye, can eye candy on what that um, subwoofer actually looks like. Um, we'll go through that in, in detail in a little bit. Lastly, we will talk about the move, copy, and updates to those documents. So right off the bat, multi-body part versus assembly. <laughs> you you, you want to think about multi-body parts as a static assembly. So they're not the best for um, showing that dynamic movement, how, how parts interact with each other uh, as they display their, their parameters, how far can they move, 
using collision detection, uh, identifying clearance. We can identify clearance, and I'll show you some really cool um, tricks or tools that we can use um, to help us out with that. And I know some of these are not commonly uh, commonly used, so definitely be on the lookout for those. Uh, most commonly, multi-body parts are either performing, you, you achieve a multi-body part from a standard part by either performing a cut extrude that separates a single part into separate bodies, or simply by deselecting that merge results option checkbox that you see in the property manager for those boss extruded features. So without further ado, I'm going to talk about that combined feature. As I said, we're going to do the add, subtract, and the common. We'll kind of walk through each one of those, and I'll, I'll highlight every time that I mention a combined feature. With the add, we see this awesome uh, image on the left where we have our two starting bodies that are overlapping and intersecting each other, and what the result would be with each one of those. When you're adding, you're taking those, those bodies that don't have any real designation, and you're merging those results. With the subtract, you are removing one of those aspects from the other. And with the common, which is um, the last of the three, we are going to utilize that, and that's actually the first one I'm going to be talking about. We're going to utilize that to create some rather unique shapes, just as you see on the lower right-hand image there. So let me pull up my SolidWorks here. And the first thing I'm going to do is we're going to bring up that eye candy. And let's make it pretty for a moment. Okay, that's looking good. I'll also do section view. We'll dice that up just like so. So there are many components um, to this, this subwoofer. And if you're wondering what kind of subwoofer is that, or if you are familiar with, with these types of speakers, what you see here are triple stacked magnets. And it's largely because of those magnets why this speaker weighs 60 pounds. I will not say what the brand is, but it is a beast of a subwoofer. And yes, I did have to tone it down inside of my single cab pickup truck. So let's uh, eliminate this eye, can eye candy for a moment and let's get back to a workable environment here just for uh, performance sake. So we have our speaker here. Let me reposition this and let's actually quickly go through our feature tree and how it was created. We see up here the solid bodies folder. And I currently have two bodies showing right there because these two bodies are separated. By the way, if you go to your system options and then you select feature manager, down here we can set the solid bodies from automatic to show so that they are always showing. And I'll, I use that because typically when you go from two solid bodies to one because of a merge, that folder disappears. And I want to make sure to keep that there for when I'm using my rollback bar and bouncing around. So in my feature manager, we see that we do have two, two separate bodies. But that's going to change as we go. I created a revolve, and I did not use the combine, or the, sorry, the merge results. So we see that I have three separate bodies now. The last body that was just added is the revolve. Using the combine feature, as we see here, here is a great comparison of the original part versus the result of the combined feature. And I'll edit that for a second and show you I use the common as opposed to the add or subtract and selected my, my two bodies to combine. Moving on, I did the same for the next to obtain that shape. And then, of course, I patterned that around to create the basket for the subwoofer. Going step by step, we can see most of these are purely resolve, uh, revolves, as that was the easiest way to create uh, this type of, of uh, a part. 
and going all the way down here, excluding the last two in my feature tree, we see that we pretty much have our complete part. Now up in the solid bodies folder, notice the name of each one of these solid bodies. They will go by the name of the last feature used. So we see resolve 14, resolve, revolve 15, 16, and then lastly we have the final revolve, which was thin seven for this body. We could combine these, but first let me rename these. I'm gonna call this first one here, magnet one. Rename the second, magnet two, and so forth. And we'll see what this does. All right, so we have our renamed here. If I scroll down, let me bring about combine six. What that one is, is it's taking those three magnets and just combining them into one solid body. Up here, we now have a combined six in addition to the resolve thin seven. Like I said, the last feature used is now the name of that uh, solid body. If I roll back, we have maintained those names in the feature tree at that point in time where the uh, rollback bar is positioned. Let's just go ahead and do a com uh, expose the combined seven. All that did was we just uh, merged the, the magnet stack into the basket just to make this truly one single solid body. And I'm doing that so that when I bring this into my other part document, which is going to be the enclosure, it will make it a lot easier when performing that move copy feature. One other thing that I will point out about this uh, model here is this, the bottom portion. When we stick this into the enclosure, we're going to run into an issue where it's too big. And of course it's too big, look at it, it's insane. I remember when I bought this thing 14 years ago, yep, that's true, I thought this thing is massive, why? But then I heard it and I fell in love. I'm gonna select this vertex here, and then I'll do a control select on this vertex down here. They are opposite ends of this bottom surface. And as we see down here, I have a distance of 10.046 inches. That could be problematic, but what I noticed in this project is that that distance there is pretty pretty large, but if I rotate just maybe 45 degrees or so, let's now check this distance here. As we see, 9.881 inches. That could definitely help us. So let me rotate this back around, I'll rebuild. And in this current state with just one solid body, I'm gonna go ahead and save this. Jumping into our next part document, I'll go ahead and open that up. We have the custom enclosure. Again, this is a SolidWorks part. U utilizing my rollback bar, we're gonna see the very first sketch that I uh, created. Every component here was very, very important. The way that this is going to be situated, or I should say at the time was going to be situated, is this is the back wall of the, the uh, single cab truck. This slanted edge here is where the passenger seat is going to be leaning against. And the floorboard was a very odd shape. To reiterate that shape, let me uh, navigate here real quick and we can see, just so you guys know what it is that I'm talking about. Let's see, it's files and right here. This is another multi-body part and you can see here my representation of that floor. I had to get creative. So jumping back here, I'll go ahead and accept this sketch. I'm not making any changes to it. And we'll go through piece by piece and see how this was created. I gave it a length because I knew the uh, space that I had to work with. Added on that, this uh, end, a quarter inch MDF board here. 
All of this, by the way, is to simulate that quarter inch MDF board. I made a cut just to give the back end some stability. And mind you, this back face is going against the back wall of that single cab truck. That front face there, I went ahead and extended that just to give it a nice uh, appearance and some additional stability. And speaking of stability, I then threw on this centerpiece here because using quarter inch MDF board, this is a heavy, heavy speaker. Lastly, I went ahead and uh, did a cut extrude here of where the actual subwoofer is going to go, or at least where I would expect it to go, fingers crossed. And then I shelled it out with a quarter inch shell to reflect all of these walls as quarter inch MDF board. That works great. Now, the next thing that I'll talk about is going to be internal volume. We're going to use mass properties in order to achieve that internal volume. We're going to do so by using the split feature combined with a combined feature. I'll show you how that works. Um, it is an alternative to the intersect command that is a very easy tool to use. However, I'm going to show you um, my approach to it using that combined feature so that we cover all of our bases within that command. Materials can also come into play. I did come across the fact that there are some non-metals like air that you can use. However, in this specific example, we're not going to use air. We just want to know the internal volume that's filled with the air. And then you can change those, un those units of measurement because typically on those spec sheets for um, audio enclosures, they use uh, cubic feet. So we'll, we'll show that as well. So jumping back into the model, let's create that internal volume. In order to do that, let's, let's make it some eye candy. Let's, uh, let's throw in a material here. For woods, I'm just going to grab that, that balsa because it looks pretty similar to MDF, except a little prettier, and it has a lot of information for the mass properties. So we're looking pretty good. We have that shell. What I'm going to do, the first step in creating my, my volume aspect is I'm going to add a new configuration. I can come over here to the configuration tab, just add a new one, and I'm going to title this volume check. That is now the active configuration. So I'll jump back over to the feature manager tree and let's throw a sketch on this plane. This does not need to be a fully defined sketch by any means, but I do want to capture a horizontal relationship there. And then I'm going to grab that sketch and make it collinear with this bottom edge that is intentional uh, as far as making this calculation. It is underdefined. That's OK. I'm going to come up here to Insert, Features. And because I already have that line selected, Split is one of the few options that I have to choose from. I'll choose my split. With it already selected, it autofills in this window. And I'm going to cut this part simply by using that single underdefined sketch. When I cut the part, we see these flags appear in the graphics area. We now have four separate bodies because of this split. Well, I want to maintain this upper portion because that is ultimately the cavity where the internal volume is important. So I'm going to select these first three bodies, make sure consume cut bodies is activated, and green check to accept. And at this stage of the game, I now have just that portion of the enclosure. We've negated the non-essential parts. We also see that this sketch line is still collinear with the bottom edge because we are currently showing the uh, the outer frame, so to speak, of this enclosure. To resolve that, we're going to create a new sketch here because when I'm calculating this internal volume using the combined feature, in addition to the split, we need to have a completely enclosed cavity. So I'll create a sketch there. And we're just going to burn through this real quick. I'll con convert those entities, extrude this. This is not the most important. I don't care about the depth. I do want to merge the result. Green check to accept, to accept that. And if we look at a section view, this is one of the tricks that we can use in this project. 
we see, yes, we have a hollowed out cavity, although we ultimately don't want that to calculate the volume. So I'll do a sketch on this bottom, or I'm sorry, this top plane. This sketch is also arbitrary as far as um, being underdefined. I don't care about that. I just want to make sure that I completely um, capture the enclosure. I'll expand this up and I do have that graphical confirmation that yes, it is completely encompassed inside of this new um, boss extrude. And here is the kicker. Do not have merge result selected. This will ensure that I have two separate bodies, which allows me to use that combined feature. Green check to accept. Now let's jump to insert features combine. We're gonna look at the subtract feature in order to uh, obtain our volume. Our main body is going to be this very large and albeit pretty uh, boss extrude. The bodies to combine is the only other body that we have, which is the inside enclosure. Green check to accept and SOLIDWORKS automatically prompts me with what bodies do I wanna keep? Do I wanna keep all? No, I only want one. So I'll choose selected bodies and it is the second body that I would like to retain. Click OK, and there we have just a solid representation of that internal volume. And we now see that this sketch line is no longer collinear because we have done away with the outside quarter inch MDF board. We can also do a section view just to determine that yes, this is indeed a solid object. And we talked about that mass properties in order to obtain the volume come up here to my evaluate tab, select mass properties, and here we see the volume that we're after. Although that is in cubic inches, as I said, the spec sheets for speakers are in cubic feet. Let's come up here to options, use custom settings, and the per unit volume, I'm gonna switch that to cubic feet. Click okay, and we have updated. We are 1.97 cubic feet, just under two. Awesome, I am within range. This looks like it's gonna be a good enclosure for me to use, so long as the speaker actually fits. And yes, I did have to make some changes as I was originally designing this. Now you're wondering, you recreated all these new features, that's why we created the uh, separate configuration. I'm now going to activate the default and it jumps back with all of these new features suppressed as I only wanted to use them for that volume check configuration. As I rotate this model around, we see that the, uh, the shell feature is still there. So now we're gonna talk about the move body feature. There are two versions of it, so to speak. The first one is gonna automatically pop up as soon as we try to insert this part. That is called the locate part. Very, very similar to the move copy. Uh, almost all of the same commands, if not all the same commands or options. With locate part, it automatically initiates and it does not require that we select the body that we're going to move or copy. With the actual move copy command, that one does require that we select a body, which is why when I initially looked at that first speaker, that uh, SOLIDWORKS part, we made everything just one single body just to simplify everything, just to avoid any potential headache. So back here in our SOLIDWORKS part environment, we have the, the um, default configuration selected. And by the way, let me just show you. If I activate the volume check and come back to the feature tree, it's indicated right here which configuration I'm in, just in case that ever gets confusion, confusing for anybody. So I'll make the default active. And let's go ahead and insert a part. Come up to the top, click insert. Notice I can insert a part, I cannot insert assembly. That would be counterintuitive. You wanna work in an assembly environment for assemblies. We're inserting a part into a part, just in case um, nobody knew that you could do that. Let's do it. So I have that submodel open. I don't have to browse for it. It automatically grabs it. That's how SOLIDWORKS uh, operates. But let's look at the property manager real quick. 
we have a lot of options here. No, I don't want to bring in the part material. I've already assigned a part material. I didn't really have, maybe I did put part materials. I definitely put part material appearances on that model, but I don't want to bring in additional materials just to complicate things. Let's keep this simple just to focus on the project. Visualize properties to propagate from the original part. Absolutely, that thing is beautiful. Let's show that off. Do a single click there. No, I don't want to populate that. And let's go ahead and get rid of these uh, planes there. So like I said, with the locate part, it automatically populates when I insert a new part. I have options to translate in the X, Y, or Z directions. Yes, I said Z because it's cooler than Z. Or I could rotate. Ultimately, I will rotate this because as we discussed, the distance between these two aspects of that bottom part is greater than these two distances. We're going to utilize that, but not quite yet. Let's actually focus on constraints. This is where it gets cool. For constraints, we have the mate settings just like we do in assemblies. It doesn't get much better than this. I already have the part selected. I don't have to uh, choose that. But if I come in here, I don't have to do a control click or anything. Just select this face which will ultimately be screwed down onto this face. I do need to change the alignment because I'm not a madman. It has to fit inside the enclosure. And I'm going to add that. I'm now ready for my next mate to add. For this one, it's going to be a coincident. And when you are inserting coincident mates, best practice is to choose a face as opposed to an edge. Let me zoom on in here, and I'm going to select now this face that I will be concentric with, and automatically the part shoots over to where I want it. I'll click Add, green check to accept, and I now have a moved part within my part. Focus your attention to the Feature Manager design tree. I now have a new part feature in my part tree. If I expand that model, I see it is one single solid body. Yes, there were those four planes that I initially used to create the part and I got rid of when I brought it in. And here is that move copy feature that is dissolved into the sub model part. From here, we're curious what the inside looks like. Let's find out. So there are a few tools that I can use. One that I've already mentioned, the section view. I'm going to bring this on out and check that clearance. Green check to accept that. And I want to look head on. On this right side here, that's looking great. That will fit. The edges line up. I'm not going to have any interference in any way. But down here, this looks like it could potentially be a problem. And spoiler alert, it was. But that's why I prefaced by saying, the dimensions at the bottom, they are optional as far as how this is placed. So let's go ahead and make that change. I'm going to bring this on down here. With the section view still up and running, I'm going to now do another move copy. So I'll go insert features, move copy. This time, instead of adding a mate, I'm going to scroll down to the property manager and choose translate rotate. I would ultimately like to rotate. However, this doesn't look like it's going to be a simple yeah, 45 degrees. So instead, like I said, you have to choose your bodies. Just grab my submodel here, zoom on in, focus my attention right here. And I'm just going to use this reference triad to help me move the model. Rotate it about there. Let's say that looks good. I'll accept it. And let's get another view head on and look at that. We have clearance. It's going to fit. I was so happy when I found that out. Did my test fits. It came out beautiful. So there we have this monster of a speaker inside a very tiny and very custom enclosure. And if we look back up at the solid bodies folder, we have shell one, because that's the last feature that we used for that 
particular solid body, which is the enclosure. And then we have the submodel that I brought in that's using uh, the combined seven. So there we have that. Let's get rid of the section view. I told you that there are a few different ways that we could check for clearance. Well, let me show you another one. And this is the one that I know a lot of people have not encountered, but it's really cool. So some of you may know, if I hover my cursor over this portion here and I hit tab, it will hide that body that I hovered over. I can move this around and take a look just in case I need a reference to bring it back. Hover my cursor over the general area where it was, shift tab, and it comes right back. But I'll show you something cooler. If I want this face to go away, just this face, right click on that face, choose change transparency. Now when I click off, we don't see completely inside the box. That's because of the shell feature. So if I come over here to my feature manager tree, expand it on out, come down to my shell, we'll make that transparent as well. And there we can now take a peek inside just to make sure that everything is good and leave that there in the design process to then add a stabilizing support inside here. Obviously, it would be completely cut out, as you may remember from that, um, that other environment multi-body part that I brought up. But this tool here was so helpful in creating this project. It was the best. Again, that's a right click on the surface or the face and change transparency. Now, the issue that I ran into with this, and I'm sure most people would, is bringing that face back. That was a challenge. In order to do it, I don't right click and change, choose change transparency because if you look in my graphics area, I'm selecting that back face now. I don't wanna do that. Just like when I hide a solid body with the tab and shift tab, I'm gonna do a shift and right click on that face, change transparency, and we've brought that solid face back. Really cool aspect that definitely helped out a lot. Regarding those updates that I could make within this, say, say I needed to, to change the depth of this. That's where it gets a little tricky with multi-body parts. When you're editing those derived parts, you find out within multi, a multi-body part environment, it's one way. For an assembly, that's, um, th that goes both ways with the associative property. So I'll mention that while using the split part and then the combine, just the split in general, you can individually save out these parts. When I had the option to save all or only save some like I did, I only saved that one, I could of course double click on that and create another part, which is very handy in multi-body parts if I'm creating, let's say, static furniture, like an end table, and I need individual parts to send off. That's great. We didn't use that in this example because I'm just in my garage, a very hot garage with my saw cutting all these pieces together. So usually the save bodies feature requires uh, changes to be made before that feature in the feature tree. So I'll show you that real quick. Let's say, just for time's sake, let's say that this was a save bodies. Anything that I make, any feature that I add after in the feature tree here will not populate. I would have to use my rollback bar before that save uh, feature. And then anything that I make will populate to those drive parts. That's all well and good. Just something that you have to uh, take account. And then with, um, with insert into new part, that's another aspect that we didn't get into. Changes to the master part will propagate to the drive parts, but not vice versa. So just some caveats to, uh, to take into account. And wrapping up here, we'll do a short recap. We talked about the differences between the multi-body part and the assemblies, the limitations and the advantages of both. We then talked about that combined feature and touched on every aspect with the add, subtract, and common. The internal volume, we found that awesome trick as opposed to using just that, uh, that simple, um, what is that command called? It's eluding me right now. Features, 
intersect. As opposed to using that, we use the split and the combine. We inserted our part, used the mates very similar to an assembly, and then we used the move copy with those mates and saw how awesome of a feature that is. All of these aspects, by the way, are covered in the SolidWorks Advanced Part Modeling Training Course that CATI offers. If you go to CATI.com and check out those training courses, I believe I saw five of them, five of those courses scheduled for this year alone that are left. And if you're wondering, did it work? Did this project come out successful? Well, I can't let you hear it, but I can tell you it sounds amazing. And here are some pictures as proof. Very first image on the left, I did a test fit. It was a very happy day when I found out that yes, it did fit. Then I carpeted it. And then the last image on the right, you can see there is that clearance where the subwoofer has room to flex. And yes, it sounds awesome. So with that, I will pass it back to my awesome host.